There are some seats up here. <laughs> <laughs> it's on. No. No. Slightly. Yeah, that's okay. right. It's on. <coughs> so I will pretend I'm Beyonce. Is it working? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we checked it earlier. It's a full room. Keep going. That's fine. So thank you all for coming. I'll just scream at this point until we know it's on. And uh, welcome to the Pulitzer Center. I see a lot of uh, new faces, so that's always exciting. And we're checking the microphone, so I'm going to keep screaming. And we do have three seats up here for any back row seaters. If you want to come up, they're free of charge. Are we on now? So my name is Ann Peters, and we're very pleased to have Patrick Brown with us to discuss his reporting on the Rohingya. Thank you. And a bit of background on the Pulitzer Center, since so many of you are new here. Uh, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and education organization, which means we raise money to provide funds to journalists, photographers, filmmakers, radio documentarians to cover underreported stories from around the globe. And so that's why we're very pleased to have Patrick with us today, because we don't only support the journalists, but we want them to get out there and talk about their work to a broad range of audiences from elementary school, middle school, and high school students and teachers at university campuses and to all of you here in the room just to create more awareness of these issues. And in addition, we also invite you to support our mission as a nonprofit. So there is a donate button on our website. We'd be happy for you to click on that, but also for those of you who have not signed up for our newsletter, please go ahead and do that as well so you can get more information on similar topics of reporting like what Patrick has undertaken. We also are happy to have Jason Motlaw here with us who worked on this project with Pat Patty, and he will be <laughs> Patrick, and he will be speaking uh, later as part of the the audience engagement. So we appreciate that. Uh, we're also happy to say that uh, based on Patrick's work, he was the recipient of the 2019 Photo Evidence Book Award, which will be on sale as well after the program. And he can speak to that as well. Uh, as some of you already know, Patrick is an award-winning photographer who's been based for some 20 years in Thailand and is currently represented by Panos Pictures. More information, uh, obviously, is on his website, on our website as well, so I won't take more time for that. Um, one thing that I would also like to remind you in terms of housekeeping is to please silence your phones. And I'd like to turn the mic over to Svetlana Bakchevanova to talk about uh, photo evidence. So <laughs> you should have one like Brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you all for coming and thank you to Police Center for supporting this. Could you hold the microphone? Uh, oh, the it microphone is important to you. Or, or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Put the uh, microphone closer to your mouth. Or <laughs> <right>. <laughs> yes. Okay. Roxa. Uh, so my name is Svetlana Bakchevanu, <laughs> difficult to pronounce names. Svetlana, we can't And I'm the publisher and co-founder of Photo Evidence, uh, the only publishing house in, uh, the North, in North America solely dedicated to documentary photography. Photo Evidence's mission is to continue the tradition of using photography to draw attention to violation of human rights and assault of human dignity and to support the work speak of up, documentary please. photographers work ah, in this tradition. Listen. Every year we award <laughs> one photographer with the Photo Evidence Book Award. We publish the work selected by international jury. And Patrick is our last uh, <coughs> recipient of the award. So here is Patrick. a little bit like 
are ruining the headlights right now. Um, yeah, I, would it be possible to kill these front row of lights yep. so we get a bit more of a Um, I know there's a lot of people in this room know quite a lot about the Rohingya crisis in the background, but I'm going to try and dress it out as smoothly as I can. Um, one of my main, or my main objectivities as, as a photographer is to try and develop a conversation with my images. Those, it can be confrontational, it can be difficult to have, but I think it's very important that images start a dialogue. and and continue that dialogue. So with that, if anybody's got any questions halfway through me doing, saying something, please put your hand up and there should be another microphone going around. <laughs> but I, this, this doesn't, a project like this doesn't happen in isolation. There's a lot of people involved, um, from translators, fixers. Sorry, we're so having trouble hearing you in the back. Can we try this one? My mum would never say that, but anyway. <laughs> is, it, is that better? I've got to go right close to yes. my head. So, yeah, start a conversation. That's what I desperately want to try and do with my images. So, this was, I thought it was going to be a one week, two week, possibly a three week assignment at the most on UNICEF, but it wasn't. It ended up going on for over seven months. I was on the ground in Bangladesh. And there was no, it was no plan to be a book in any way. It just sort of came to what we have today. When I first got there, um, well, I'll draw it back a little bit. Is I was hearing news coming out that there was something really bad happening from in, in Burma, but it was all the news was coming from Cox's Bazaar, and there was nothing coming from Rakhine State. But the stories that were coming out were, you know, pure evil, and I, I knew it was something big. Most of my work on to that stage has been on the eastern border uh, with Thailand, Burmese eastern border, with the ring, with the Kachin, the Shan, the Cayenne. So I was quite aware of what the Burmese military can do. And murder, executions, rape, raising of villages is, is not unheard of. But these stories were were very different. So when I first arrived, I had, I had no, I wasn't prepared. I was, and I still feel that I never got an image that really portrayed the pure scale of it. You know, 10 people turn into 100, 100 turn into thousands, thousands turn into tens of thousands, and then literally hundreds of thousands of people were coming across the border in all states some with some cooking pots, some with the shirts on their back, some with nothing. Young Noor here at the, in the forefront, and I never was able to find her again. She's 11 years old. On that boat, there was about 80 people on that boat, and that came in not too far from a tourist destination. Cox's Bazaar is also the French Riviera of Bangladesh, which you can imagine isn't the French Riviera. So it's... It was really, there was a real, there was a lot of contrast that was going on, not just in the imagery, but where these people were coming from and where they were arriving. The, this, as you can see on the left of the frame, is Burma in the background. This, this, this group has taken five hours to paddle across the Nap River, which separates Burma and Bangladesh. Um, the reason it's taken them so long is because of the currents, but they had to time it, otherwise they would get sucked out into the open ocean, into the Bay of Bengal. And the true numbers who ever made it, who tried it, and succeeded are unknown. We really don't know. But because it was a UNICEF project, this I focus quite obviously on the children, and over 60% of the refugees are kids under the age of 14. And as you can see, there's there's no real adults in there, except for the, the women and uh, the mothers. The, this raft is built out of bamboo, um, jerry cans, and stitched together with rope and lashed together, and, and there's a tar pulling on the top of it. And that's, that's how they moved across, and it was 80 to 90 people on each raft. 
um, myself and the National Geographic photographer John Stanmire um, swam out to these guys and we got on board and we travelled with them as they moved up the coast. So you can see the two radio masts um, in the, the right of the frame. From there to where the position where this photograph was taken, it took me about four hours to walk there. I've had a, you know, I'm fairly fit, I can say. Um, I've eaten, I've rested. Uh, and that was like walking through treacle. The mud was just, I cannot describe. I lost two cameras and the lens just in, due to the humidity. These guys would take, it would take them about 10 hours to cross. And it was, it was just torturous to watch. It was really, these guys were exhausted. They'd already been walking for 10 days with no food. The, the situation sort of escalated with, with the numbers, of course, and there was, the border would open up, the Bangladeshi military would open up the border, and there would, people would just flood in. There would be three or 4,000 people who were waiting to cross, and the, and the Bangladeshis were sort of trying to control the influx of people just due to, because they were overwhelmed by it all. And when they were coming in, they were coming in all states. This, this old man, and the, he's blind, and his son is carrying him. And then that's his family in the background. Then once they got inland, the, the Burmese, sorry, the Bangladeshis would then put them in trucks and they would then be moved up from the border regions and then moved up into the refugee camps to be processed. This, um, this was the first time I'd actually seen people relax and sleep. They were suddenly in a truck, they were giving information, they, were, they had been given water, they'd been rehydrated, and, and I found this image quite compelling just to do all the different expressions on people's faces and the different states of anxiousness about what's going to hold and also being relaxed and for the first time in possibly a week or two. And the strange thing, it's, it's wet season, so the amount of rain that is coming down is just, I cannot describe it. it the hailstorm yesterday is like that with rain, just incredibly intense. This image, I have problems with this image um, on many fronts. Um, receiving an accolade for an image of dead children is, is not something that, a photographer wants to be known for. But the World Press Award is a totally anonymous award. Um, so the award, I don't see the award for me, I see it more for the judges. The judges are the ones that felt that this image best described, articulated what was happening with the Rohingya crisis. So it's their award, not mine. And it's, it's for the Rohingya people not for me. And I believe that the world press in this particular instant, they wanted to highlight what was happening. And by doing so, they thought it needed to be presented and awarded. The thing that is really startling about this image is I got a phone call from a colleague about four o'clock in the afternoon, and it was a really big storm in the Bay of Bengal. Um, the sky was black. In the Bay of Bengal, if anybody knows that region, it's a very turbulent ocean and lots of people do die and the cyclones, the cyclones can push up. In 1992, there was a cyclone that came through there that Cox's Bazaar took a direct hit and 300,000 people were killed. They moved to uh, 3.5 million people. The wind speed, it was the first time a super storm had been measured and the wind speeds were uh, up to 125 miles an hour. So you can imagine if a storm hits there now with another 900,000 people on board, it's going to be it's going to be bad. So I got this phone call from a colleague and made my way to the scene. When I arrived, there was a mob of police, local journalists, international journalists, and sailors and fishermen that had collected the bodies and brought them up to the road. And it was the the car headlights that were sort of coming in and out of the frame. And I slowly made my way through the crowd 
And there was just out of this out of this shot, there's a, a man identifying his wife. But it was the children that um, really got to me, like the cloth falling over their bodies and giving them an identity without actually naming them as such. And there's so many contradictions in this image, the color, the red against the green, the, the relaxed, composed year, but yet it's, it's death. The one thing I find really troubling is the word ethnic cleansing. There's nothing clean about ethnic cleansing. It's systematic, calculative murder. And that is ethnic cleansing. The innocent. I had a lot of trouble with this image. Um, that's sweat I don't understand. Um, I was talking to Jason today about this image. I nearly, I nearly pulled the book because of this image. Um, it's the children that were in the previous picture. And it's the day after, and it's the father identifying the bodies. Um, I'm identifying children, and they're dead. And I thought I'd gone too far. I thought I'd overset the mark as a photographer. I really did think I'd, I'd made a mistake. Um, and I realized I was more concerned about my own career than the man. And that's not what's this about. It's not about me. It's about that guy in the picture. So to re retract that, I contacted a bunch of people and I slowly worked through this argument I had with myself. And I think that's one thing that we have to constantly ask ourselves. You've got to constantly question yourself. Are you doing the right thing? Make sure your compass sort of comes back. There's, there's so many things that come into it that can push you in different directions. But you've got to constantly question yourself. And this was a battle I had to go through. We nearly pulped the book. I, nearly, I was not going to run it. And I talked to a couple of people. And uh, David Campbell from the World Press Awards, he said, Patrick, this book is about ethnic cleansing. And I think you put your shows it in a, the best possible light in the sense of not being grotesque and not being obscene. The innocent do die in that situation. The survivors from the, the boat, I'll, I'll go back a little bit, there was 80 people on that boat. Um, there were 17 survivors and 15 bodies. Uh, and that's all they were able to, to reclaim. And that's the survivors burying family members or family. One of the things, that, the conversation that I talked about earlier on, is I, I want people to realize that how lucky they are, especially what we are in the West. I mean, the most dangerous thing I've done today is that I've had some water. I drank some water out of the tap. And um, to just realize what you have. There's 900,000 people in a refugee camp on the, and their total reliance on life is what is given to them by foreign aid. Drinkable water, latrines, education, health, everything. They have no job. They're in this, this state of flux that doesn't seem to move in either direction. And when it does, it hits a, hits a wall and bounces back in. Going back to, as the Burmese military like to call it, the, clean, the cleansing operation that took place on the, the 25th of August, 2017. I wanted to demonstrate how brutal this particular operation was. And again, there was no cleansing operation in this, in this way. These are the tools of the refugees, um, and the similar tools to this were confiscated two days before the, clean, uh, the cleaning operation began. And then these tools were used against them, and they were you know, used to murder family members, because you don't want to waste bullets when you can collect your own uh, farming implements free.
I wanted the children to have a voice. Uh, one of the things that we were all, we, when I say we, the, the journalistic community and were struggling with was that we were photographing the consequences of actions. We weren't photographing the actions. So what, what people were running from, we had none of that. We just had them running to us in some way. And the only evidence that we had was besides the testimonies and the, the scars that people had or the injuries were these drawings that the UNICEF set up these learning centers with child-friendly spaces and gave them crayons, gave the children crayons and pencils and paper. With no instructions, they ended up sort of, quite a few of them started drawing these horrific scenes. And I started to document them and record them. Um, and I just, it's just so shocking that this, this is, this is drawn by a, a nine-year-old. This is drawn by, a this one's drawn by a 13-year-old. And you can see on the left of the side is the, is the uh, Buddhist uh, village, and in the center is the Muslim village. Yes, they did use attack helicopters. They did use mortars. They, they used a lot of big tools on these unarmed civilians. And this is a drawing from a village called Puli Puli, which experienced a, a brutal massacre. It was raised off the face of the planet. The true death toll is not known. Um, International, um, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and a few other organizations have different figures. They fluctuate between 500 to 1,500 people. Some people possibly say 3,000. But it was, the, it was the systematic approach, as you can see from this drawing. This, this child doesn't know about systematic ethnic cleansing, but you can see by the drawing of the naivety of this drawing, but how the army surrounded and moved in from the south and attacked. This young boy um, received, he was running away with his uncle and luckily the, the round was at the end of its velocity in some way and it penetrated just underneath his arm, but luckily it wasn't, it didn't have enough velocity to go carry on and it hit his rib cage and slowed down, but his uncle cut the the, the shrapnel out, out of his chest using one of the tools that we I showed you before and they, they needed to, they could only get the big pieces out. And when he got to um, Cox's Bazaar, he was taken to the hospital and then they took the rest out. But he likes to play cricket, but he, he can't bowl anymore because his arm is, is quite sore. He's a good kid, he's, he's just a kid. This, this is quite an intense story, this one, Mohammed. And this was the, the first time I met him. Excuse me. Yeah, Mohammed is 13 years old in this picture. Um, he was running away from the village being attacked with his uncle, and the military opened fire. They hit three people and killed them instantly and a round went through his arm and shattered it and took it clean off. And the only, and he was still hanging on by the tendons and ligaments and muscle and tissue. So he's running, he's holding his up with his right arm, he's holding his left arm while he's running up into the, the tree line. Gets into the tree line and his uncle puts a tourniquet on it and slows the, bleed, slows the bleeding. They then get into a riverbed and with a very, the nickname is a bamboo knife from bamboo machete. They use it to cut the bamboo down. So his uncle sharpens the knife on a pebble in a, in a, on a riverbed, a very a stream, I should say, and it cuts away the tendon. Meanwhile, the bone is hollow because it's been shattered. And his uncle uses these leaves that have antiseptic qualities, and they shove it up into the bone, shove it up into the arm, and they strap it. And he, hit, he hides for a month in the forest until they find an opportunity to get over to, Bur uh, to uh, Bangladesh. He gets over to Bangladesh and by pure miracle, there is no infection. It's, it's, an, it's an incredible story. 
And when I was there, they, the doctors um, needed a blood transfusion. So they got his blood type, and they went onto the streets of Cox's Bazaar and just started asking people. And they almost, it was almost a live blood transfusion. It was about an hour to test, well, obviously, parasites and all, and test the blood. But he survived. I met him a year ago, or after this, I, it, was a, it was September, November last year. And he's a typical teenager, and he's a little bit lost. Oh, he'd lost his mother and father and all his immediate family when this picture was taken. He, they, they all of them were dead. And when I re-met him, he just discovered that his family was still alive, but they were in refugee camps in Burma, and it wasn't looking good for them. So, but everybody's alive, so he's in a slightly better place in that sense. But he's, it's a bit of a dark humor twist here. He asked me through my translator um, if, if this Iron Man dude on the TV, <laughs> if he could get one of his arms. And it was kind of an interesting moment because he was, he was just suddenly he was an adolescent little boy who wanted to have an, you know, a six million dollar man arm. But in this case, it's obviously an Iron Man's arm. And I contacted MIT and there's an organization, organization called Hope and they're going to try and 3D print an arm. Yes. Print. But it's very difficult because usually 3D printer arms are from the, from the forearm, but it's up on there. So they're going to try and do something for him, but they're going to try and teach him code as well, and he's going to print his own arm. So there is, at the end of this, there is there's something for man. He's, he's a really sweet kid. Is, is that being traversed, or is that some no, that's, lettering on No, that's just the lettering. That's how they write six and ten with it. Yeah, that was the six in the end. Another sad story. Um, I was waiting for the afternoon light in, in the camp, just, just minding my own business as life was going on in the camp. And this, oh, she's probably in her mid-twenties. She starts walking up to me with a, uh, a blanket, one of those typical wool blankets that we've all seen. And usually, you know, and it's rolled up, and I could, I could see what where this was going. It was obviously a, a body, and she just walks up to me, and, and then I follow her to her house, and she lays it out, and it was her son, and he had died from a cough. That's all we know at that time, um, and they didn't have anything to cover his face, and so they used beetle, beetle nut leaves. And I, I just find this a really a sad, but yet um, and a very, very innocent moment that's got lost. The, the one, the lady on the left is his mother, and the lady on the right is his auntie. And they're, they're actually looking at his body, trying to figure out what to do. This, I found this family on the side of the road in a, a really, in a really bad, muddy, inf infested, mosquito infested, human feces everywhere part of the trail where people were coming in. And they were, they were absolutely exhausted and they just, they didn't care, they just sat down. And they sat, they fell asleep. And they're on the side of the Technaf Highway, which is not a highway, it's about as wide as this street. Why does this room join? They've been walking for nine days, if my memory serves me correct. And on the seventh day, she, oh sorry, on the sixth day she gave birth. And because she'd been walking for so long, she hadn't eaten and she hadn't been taking any, any intake of, of any sort. She had no breast milk. And a newborn baby died a day later. She just could not, couldn't feed her. And this picture, she hadn't spoken since that. All the information came from her husband. The young boy next to her is her, is her eldest brother, the brother closest to her age, which is 25 years old. Now, the refugee camp is the size of Copenhagen. It takes you about 45 minutes to drive it. It's more, more densely populated than Manhattan. Um, it, the one thing that I 
that many people don't do, and I think it, it needs to be done, is actually complement the, bang, the Bangladeshis. Where on earth would 900,000 people roll up on somebody's doorstep and they say, okay, let's take you in? You have to give credit where it's due. This is not an easy fix. It's not going to be fixed this year, next year. But I think we sort of have to tip our hat to these guys. One of the ideas to try and spread out the population and try to resolve or try to fix this, this island is in the Bay of Bengal. It didn't exist until it started to exist in 1992 after the cyclone. It's a sandbar, basically. That patch in the center is um, an area that they want to put 150,000 people and it's about two and a half meters above sea level. Uh, there's no trees on there, there's nothing. The first cyclone that comes into this area is just going to destroy it. Not only is Bangladesh at the forefront of climate change, but it's also very prone to, to cyclones. So this is not a quick, this is not a very well thought out plan in my view, but this is an idea that wants to be thrown out there. Um, there's some things that I am proud of, and um, one of my things is, is, is discovering this man. Sounds a very strange thing to say, and even coming out from my own lips. Um, I was looking for any survivors or any connection to the, the Tully Tully massacre, and, and this was shot in November 2017. What's kind of interesting about this, this gentleman is he's a retired Burmese soldier in the refugee camp. He retired in the 80s, but he was a radio operator for the Burmese military. And he was detained two days before the massacre. His family were put basically under house arrest, yet he was locked up and put next to the radio room in the command center of the Burmese police, which is basically the military. They he didn't realize that he knew all the codes, he knew all the sayings, he knew all the, all the information, um, and he was very much aware of what was going in, which generals were coming in, or which ranked generals coming in, on what type of helicopter. He was there, his, his testimony is now in The Hague. It's now part of the UN uh, report on the violence in Burma. And sadly he passed away, and um, just not so long ago. He was a smoker, so I put, and he had a bad chest when I met him, but I think that was the, probably the reason. But his escape is something that is made of legends. It really is. He was detained for about two months, and they kept beating him on a, a tradition, um, on a regular basis, trying to get him to convert back to Buddhism. Um, and they, they really did beat him quite badly. And there is a, in Thailand, it's called Lokapong, where they release um, balloons and, and they also get very drunk, they did the same thing in Burma. And he waited for this period and he waited for the soldiers to have a few drinks and he went to the latrine and he literally went through the hole in the latrine, slid down there into the, the riverbed which is full of human feces and then made his way out, got into the bigger stream, bigger river and they saw him in open fire but they didn't get him. And he was about, it took him about a week to get to the refugee camp and he found his family. But his story is quite phenomenal. And I was, I was unaware at the time of how important his, his information was. And then I got Jason involved and we, we cross-referenced him and we, we tried to find out if there was any holes in his story. Not one hole in his story. His timeline was spot on every time. And yeah. His testimony is paramount to the, the Tuli Tuli massacre. That's him drawing in my notebook the rank of the soldiers the, where the attack took place. Um, you can see police station, there's a circle there with the police on it, and how he escaped and the latrines and the village. These Portraits from here on are um, the survivors of the female survivors of the Kalitu massacre. 
what happened to these ladies, I wouldn't wish on my, my worst enemy. They incredibly strong individuals. They were, all of them had their throats slit, but luckily not deep enough. And what, hap what happened to them is, is beyond evil. Asam, she, she witnessed, she was forced to her knees on the, the banks of the river that separated the, the Muslim and the Buddhist village. Forced to her knees, she had arms pulled behind her back. She had a, an AK put to her head and she had a, mach a bamboo machete to her throat. And she watched as all seven members of her male, the males were all slaughtered in front of her and beheaded and then thrown on a fire. Then they slit her throat, and she thought, that's it, she was dead. And she woke up unconscious, but they just got her chin just under here. This lady, to me, is um, an absolute superhero. She's, she's an integral part of the book, an integral part of Jason's work, and, and she's a driving force of why I'm still here today. Majima, she's... In this picture, she's 22. She, she was rounded up, rounded up by the Burmese military and the mob with other Rohingya women. Um, and they discovered her three-year-old boy underneath her dress. The Burmese took the three-year-old boy, killed, her in front of, killed the boy in front of her, and then threw the body on the fire. And she watched as he burned. Then they took her into a house and raped her multiple times. And she, they locked the house up, the Burmese military and the mob locked the house up and set fire to it. And there was about nine other women that she was with. The, she found a weak point in the house and was able to break out and she escaped. And she, she, was, she looked behind her as the house was in flames and there was no, nobody following her. I had a lot of um, problems with these pictures. And the question, would I photograph these, would I photograph many of the women in this room the same way if this story was done in the West? And it took me some time to, to wrestle this. If this, the ethical question is like, you need to have a signature from somebody to give you permission to use it. That signature, in my view, is not to protect these people. It's to protect the establishments that run these businesses and these magazines and publications. But it also, it made me question why I was so concerned about this. And we sat, we sat on them for about six months, and Jason's very much aware of the battle that I had with his, what I release these pictures. First of all, I'm taking this person who's going back to the worst day of their life to tell you the story. And you have to respect that. You really do have to respect that. So I was trying to explain to Regina where these pictures are going to end up. They're going to end up on the internet, they're going to end up in magazines, they're going to be possibly talking to people like you. It's going to be you're going to be known around the world. This is a 20-year-old illiterate woman. She said to me, Patrick, I did nothing wrong. Why should I have? I know what the internet is. I know there's a bigger world out there. I committed no crime. The crime was committed against me. And I, I realized I was looking at it from a very Anglo-Saxon perspective and not looking at it from her perspective. Why should I deny her the right? This is the only justice this woman's probably going to get to see. Why should I deny this lady? She understands what's happened among anybody. And this is why I'm still here today, is because of Regina. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This 
is fuel bunker, by the way. I'll hand it over. Should we give one mic for the audience? <laughs> Are there any questions? When you're documenting such horrible things, can you or how do you separate yourself in some way so you can... You talked a lot about the struggle of like, should I publish this photo or should I show it to other people? When you're in the situations, do you have any sort of feeling like, should I even be here? Or how do you separate yourself to any degree to remain sane and at least somewhat impartial? So it's a really important question and that, that goes back to my point of constantly questioning yourself. Why am I here? What am I doing? Am I, am I doing no harm? Am I going to make things better? You need to constantly readjust your, your compass because it does move. It does move with, um, with many influences. But you've got to ask yourself those questions. How do I stay sane? I've got friends and colleagues who have been through very similar things, and they are my wife. She's my keel. So it's all part of the, the structure that I have around me. Yeah, I um, uh, is this on? It's on, I guess. I, I we talked earlier, I had worked with a human rights agency, but it's it's so different because uh, with... Pull the microphone closer to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, with a human rights agency in Thailand that had worked uh, with Rohingya communities and on Rohingya, um, re then refugee issues back in 2000, but it's, it's one thing to be very distant and removed in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and not be in the in the thick of it, um, and now here we are in 2019 without having, um, I mean, with with 700,000 more people in Cox's Bazaar, which is in Bangladesh. Um, and I guess my my question is, it's is what about how are those 700,000 or now 900,000 people staying sane themselves. What is the joy for the Rohingya? I've, I've seen, some, I mean, it's right there in some resort area. Are they able to play? Are they able to get out to the ocean? Were you able to document any of, of that or did you have the opportunity to, to hear some of the, some joy? Thank you. Kids are kids. They'll find everything to play with. They usually play with something that the UN's given them and they make it into a slide. Um, you know, they, they will make the best of the situation that's in front of them. Yeah, there is a lot of damaged souls there. And, that's, and it'd be a bit strange if it wasn't, to be honest. Um, the joy, um, I think it's, it's childhood. It's, it's children, you know, enjoying the youth. But what do they have for the future? Um, I might hand that part over to Jason, but it, I don't see much of a light, to be honest, personally. Sorry, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think Patty was there more recently. That's a really hard one, is it? You don't want to give false hope. I think a lot of the NGOs, you know, it's in their business model to promote these various campaigns. And, um, it's pretty abject. <laughs> Um, not a lot to be hopeful. I mean, we were just talking today at lunch, you know, about how dire the situation is right now in the camps, and you know, the, the international will to really mobilize and do something about this uh, is is not really there. And if allowed to fester, I mean, this is a perfect breeding ground for all the things that the Burmese government was alleging in Rakhine for so long. Um, the radicalization, the move towards militancy. Um, I just, that almost feels inevitable, given the degree of desperation, the despair. And um, for all the efforts that Bangladesh has made to accommodate these people, which, you know, Patty rightfully highlighted, is truly extraordinary. 
you know, they have problems of their own. And as some of these symptoms start to bear themselves out, whether it's criminality, there are reports of trafficking, of drug smuggling, uh, that patients at hospitality can start to wear thin. And that is another set of problems. So, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think we both walked away from this story pretty shaken. You know, I've covered a lot of really dire stories, but this one has really haunted me. And um, I like to consider myself a hardened optimist a lot of the time. And this really, really tested that, that faith. Molly, um, thank you for this presentation. I lived in Burma, Myanmar for about seven years um, and worked with a lot of Rohingya activists. There was a photographer who has been covering the camp crisis back to 2009, Greg Constantine, um, and he has struggled with this as well. And he has tried to have photo expedition, uh, expeditions within Myanmar. And there's this big disconnect because a lot of the community within Myanmar, because of the breakdown in geographic barriers and social media barriers, um, it's really easily to convince them that what is happening here is actually a falsity, that it's not actually happening. And I'm curious if you've tried to put these photographs and the stories on display to the mainstream public within, let's say, just Yangon. And I know that's a challenge because the government in and of itself has been really uh, an obstacle for journalists and photographers in particular to get them visas and to put these uh, these photos on display. But I'm curious what your efforts are, have been to reach the everyday Myanmar public on these stories and what's happening. Because I think sometimes uh, I found that when they see it with their own eyes, they're, they're a bit more open to what's happening. Um, that one is a very tricky one. Very good question, thank you. Um, no, I haven't tried. I think I probably know what the answer would be, and I imagine the images would be destroyed if they were put in a public form. But putting all that aside, um, there was a display at the uh, Rangoon Photo Festival of Kevin Fry's work, which he won a World Press for. And kind of interesting enough, when Kevin was doing his talk, artist walk, through the, the exhibition, the Burmese Ministry of Culture wasn't there. So that walk never took place. So within the community, there is, it is happening, but it's also being played with very uh, cotton gloves. And how do you manage it? Because it, it's a very, very sensitive subject. There is people there that know about this. Um, there's a Burmese gentleman here today from Radio Free Asia. But it's a very difficult one to actually manage, and I haven't tried myself, to be honest. But I would like to. After the Holocaust, we said never again, and we've let it happen again. Why is that, or do you have any input on how, and why isn't this on the front page of the Washington Post constantly? Easy questions today. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I've been railing about, too. I don't have an easy answer for that. Uh, you can take the, the very cynical view that you know these are non-white, stateless people on the other side of the world, which probably goes a long way to explaining this. I mean, no one is really doing the Rohingya's bidding internationally or in the country, and that's a big point. You know, so this outburst of violence that we saw in 2017, you know, as dramatic and wholesale as it was, it wasn't out of the blue. This had been precipitating for a long time. You know, we were covering this uh, in the camps you know, the, in Rakhine back in 2012. And the writing was on the wall back then. So by degrees, I think the authorities realized what they could get away with, that the UN and a lot of the Western missions in the capital would ultimately uh, acquiesce to what was going on and 
in the interest of preserving diplomacy and not take a firm stance against the military, against the government. And so by degrees, things intensified. And you know, some contend that what you saw in October of 2016, the initial pogroms uh, in Rakhine were sort of a test run for what you saw in 2017. And there's quite a lot of evidence that, that backs that up. There's a really hard-hitting report by uh, Fortify Rights. It's an organization directed by some friends of ours. And it basically lays that case out very thoroughly that um, the government was you know, having already removed freedom of, of movement uh, and various other civil liberties, was prepositioning troops, was cutting off food supply, confiscating weapons, farm tools, kitchen knives, and raising uh, civil militia all in advance of this crackdown. It was then just a matter of some kind of a spark, some pretext to kick off this scorched earth campaign that you saw. And I don't think that's off the mark. Um, and the way that, you know, as these different escalations were piling up, you still found this reticence among the UN and other governments to, to call it for what it was, for fear of being on the hook, you know, internationally and compelled to respond forcefully. And you know, it was only in hindsight that you started to get some strong words like you know, ethnic cleansing or um, you know, bears the hallmarks of genocide. I mean, these euphemisms that we talk about, but no one would just call it what it is and, and, and act. And we've seen this before, and I don't think this will be the last time. If anything, I think what we saw here is some kind of a template in certain parts of the world in certain contexts where you can get away with this kind of thing. I know that sounds terrible. but. Uh, That's my feeling on, on where we are now. This is not new to Burma, like I said right at the beginning. It's happening, it's happening right now in Shan State. There's a full-scale war. In Southern Shan State, there's a full-on scale war. This is just the, the pure scale of what happened in Rakhine State. That is what was new to this. It was totally engineered. The, they're totally, they don't have any arms. And if they do, it's very small. The Shan State Army, the Wa, the Cayenne, they all have soldiers. So they, the Burmese are playing those a little bit more softly than they would do with the Rohingya. So if we need to give our attention as an entity, not just on the Rohingya, even though it, how drastic and traumatic it was, there's, it's also happening in the whole country. The UN report isn't singular to the Rohingya camp. Uh, state and Rakhine state, but it's actually the whole country. Uh, hello, thank you very much for presenting these photographs. Uh, uh, if the world were paying proper attention, have you formed in your minds uh, a form that a possible solution could take, what the world could do to bring about some kind of resolution on this? Yeah, another easy one. Um, no, I haven't. Um, my job as a photographer is to, this is what I'm good at. It's for people who are policy makers, think tanks. These guys come up with these grand plans. But there's one thing that I, my wife is a sociologist, and her area is education. Education is the root of all evil, and it is the root of all evil. It depends on what is being taught. So, if education can be implemented within, across in Burma or in Bangladesh, there might be something that will come out of that. But as a structure, that is, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting up here with a microphone. I don't consider myself an activist. My job is a photographer, and it's for other people who have those, those strings to power who are able to pull those levers. I've done the best thing I can do. Um, it's now for somebody else to take the mantle, to take it and run a little bit further, and then give it to the next guy.
I just wanted to say there's a, a local, there's an organization that's based here in Washington, D.C. called International Campaign for the Rohingya. If you're interested in any advocacy efforts, they've been working on a lot of different issues, including genocide gems, and I think that might be part of, personally, it might be part of the reason why there's not a lot of uh, immediate international response because there's m mining and there's oil resources and these other, I am an activist, I'm not afraid to say that. Um, and I, I, but I encourage you to, to look up information about international campaign for the Rohingya and, and see if they're, they're working on issues that you can help share information about or get more information from them. The executive director, I don't know if he's here tonight. I don't see Simon, Simon Billingness. Um, uh, he's been working on, he's a human rights worker and he's been doing stuff with, with the Rohingya for, for decades. Um, I don't have any answers personally. I, I agree that there needs to be someone that runs with it. I was, I was talking with Patrick earlier about, um, you know, the, so many other international uh, crises where there's a, a climate event or a, a mass migration. There's a lot of international attention, resources, and, and aid are, are deployed. There, there's food and wonderful, amazing Chef Jose Andres is in all these locations simultaneously with World Central Kitchen. Um, but not, not in Cox's Bazaar. Not yet, anyway. And um, that goes the same for the maybe the Bonos of the world, too. I, I don't think it's on the celebrity chefs and the celebrity musicians to, to solve the world's problems, but they have the platform, but we do too. Um, I, I think if, if you, <coughs> I, I don't, I'm gonna just say, uh, I'm gonna reference Nike, I'm gonna just say just do it. If you wanna help, just do it. So we have time for one more question. And then there'll be time obviously afterwards on the conversation. Thanks. Thanks for me as well, um, former journalist. I have a sense of the uh, the internet firewalls in China, and I've been in all throughout Asia except for Burma. And I, but I have no, I don't know Burma well enough to know. I'm sure there's a lockdown on the internet. Are you aware at all of whether there have to be some seepage, there has to be some seepage in the, you know, at least some universities you would hope, or young folks, professors, anyone? Um, are you aware of whether your images have somehow penetrated, you know, those those barriers and made it through to at least some folks, you know, change or raise awareness at some level? It, that sort of follows on from the question earlier on, I think. But. It has, but it's in the same echo chamber as this room. Um, the, the internet in Burma is Facebook. And Facebook has, has, it, has actually stuck its hand up saying they were an integral part of this hate speech. And they're saying that they didn't know anything about it. They only had five Burmese speaking people working. Yeah, but they sort of knew what was happening. It's... It's... Um, Burma is a kind of interesting place when you talk about the internet. It's, again, my way of reference in my life. But is, um, it's got the fastest mobile penetration of any nation on Earth. It went from basically 15% of the population to 75% of the population in about a five-year window. So it was an internet experiment. And Facebook was part of it. It's all kept quiet. It's not really common knowledge. Um, and they wanted to see what, what would happen. Um, and this, that's documented, and you can you can find all that there. The the sea beach that you were talking about, the, the firewalls, it's going to be in the same echo chambers as this. Um, the the word Rohingya isn't even used in diplomatic language. They're not called Rohingya. They're called Ben. They're called Bengali. So they're not even recognizing them as a, a race. So this opens up a whole can of worms that uh, people with a lot of letters after their names are still trying to struggle to figure out what to do with it. Did you want to say anything? 
anything further? I, I think Patty really said it. Um, yeah, it's hard to overstate how weaponized social media has become. Uh, it's virulent. And what's, what's always startled me is you know, for all the excellent reporting that's come out of this crisis, it's just as reflexively dismissed as fake. That these videos engineered, that the pictures are staged, the words are lies, these aren't people. And you know, how do you get to the root of that? You know, when you can so easily dehumanize an entire group and trivialize the most awful things imaginable. And I think a lot of that just speaks to how systematically the authorities, the military namely, has demonized this group, stripping them of the, their rights and trying to foment the kind of radical behavior that aligns with this caricature that they've created, stoking fear. And it's not just the Rohingya, it's dozens of other ethnic groups around the periphery that the, the, the very essence of the country, that the Buddhist character is under attack. And they've cultivated that very craftily. And I think you're seeing the, the fallout of that right now. It's, it's, it's deeply embedded. So I want to thank our speakers, Patty and uh, Jason. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it's a little warm in here, so um, we can. Maybe it's a perfect temperature. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, the photo evidence uh, books are out there. Um, obviously, we'd be here to talk a little bit more for folks who are shy about asking questions in public, but do, uh, do mingle a little bit further out uh, so we can uh, still talk to each other. Thank you very much.